you see on your left a bunch of banners, uh, which actually come from, I'm pretty sure that they were made by uh, Tina Van Kulen a number of years ago. Yeah, and Margaret? Okay. And uh, so uh, the Visuals Committee found these. And because uh, I said I was going to preach a little bit on Isaiah during November and then in Advent, they found these. And I will, I'll be careful what I say here, but somebody suggested to me, well, look, see those verses, are, they don't really line up with the text that you're planning to preach on. Can you adjust the text that you preach on just to line up with each one of those texts? And then they'd fit perfectly. Uh, they, my, I didn't, and they still will line up well. Uh, but it's just wonderful that we have these resources available to us and that remind us of this kind of whole incredible book of Isaiah, which we're going to dive into a little bit. Um, it's not just, um, and maybe one of the reasons why I wanted to start looking at it in November, is to remind ourselves it's not just an Advent text. Maybe in the church sometimes it gets kind of pushed to Advent in many years, but it's not just an Advent text. And so we want to look at it and see how Isaiah is, offers us so much that invites us to live faithfully in the 21st century, how we worship and respond to the living God. And so we're going to look uh, first this morning at Isaiah 6, so I invite you to turn in your Bibles, uh, in your Red Pew Bibles, to uh, Isaiah chapter 6, where we'll read uh, what's described in the NIV as, as Isaiah's commission. And before we read uh, God's word, would you join me in prayer? God, you are a God of extravagant grace, and we pray this morning that your spirit would refresh our hearts through the reading and preaching of your word, so that we might perceive anew the magnitude of your grace and grow in our faith and thankful living for Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, for how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie, lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields, fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. This is the word of the Lord. It's maybe a, a saying that you hear, you know, relatively regularly, regularly, with regularity, often. Um, you are what you eat, right? Um, kind of eating maybe even shapes our identity, defines a little bit of who we are. A particular food might highlight an ethnicity or a nationality or an age. One country might be associated with uh, refried beans and enchiladas and burritos. Another country might be uh, connected with olibolin and chocolate hagel and, and droppies. Or one age group might be more likely to eat freezies and dunkaroos and yogurt from a tube 
whereas another age group is maybe more likely to eat asparagus and pickled herring and coffee. One group is more likely to eat salad and, and whole wheat products and, and fruit and vegetables. Another is uh, known for consuming potato chips and fast food and ding-dongs. Right? Eating this type of food, of course, we know, doesn't guarantee that, that you are Mexican or Dutch, that you are young or old, that you are healthy or a couch potato. But in a sense, we, we know that you, know, you are what you eat. And this morning, as we look at Isaiah 6, the message of Isaiah isn't so much you are what you eat. Uh, rather, his message is both a, a warning and a promise. And, and that's this, that we become what we worship. We become what we worship. Um, Timothy Keller helps uh, us, be us by reminding us, you know, first off, that an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know that I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. And so just even if we think about being shaped by idols, in order to understand Isaiah 6 and what's going on, we need to know what's been going on already in this uh, first five chapters of Isaiah's prophecy against Judah. Most of these chapters, the first ch chapters, outline God's judgment on Judah and Jerusalem and in them, Isaiah lambastes God's people for things like failing to care for the needy, and especially for their worship of idols. And so Isaiah announces the Lord's judgment in chapter 2, saying, you know, look, you've abandoned your people. You've, the whole house of Jacob has done this. Uh, their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their own hands, to the things that their fingers have made. And, and in our passage, Isaiah is then told to give them this message. Go tell the people, be ever hearing and never understanding, be ever seeing and never perceiving. And, and I wonder if this calls something to mind, right? This judgment against Judah, Judah is that they will become like the idols that they worship. The judgment against Judah is that they will be blockheads, just like the wooden idols that they worship and create with their own hands. Judah becomes like the idols they worship. And so, too, we become what we worship. It, it's kind of a self-imposed judgment. Isaiah is told to, 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 to make the heart of this people calloused, to make their ears dull, their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And maybe we even hear that and kind of shake our head a little bit and saying, think, you know, I mean, doesn't God want his people to be healed? Doesn't God want them to understand and, and turn and, 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 and get this healing? I mean, isn't God in the business of healing? And of course, the answer is yes. Yes, God is in the business of healing. But somehow God also allows his people to experience some of the consequences of our own sin. In many effects, that's his judgment. Now, of course, some of us hear that word judgment I sometimes hear that word judgment, and, and it, it seems like a four-letter word, right? Judgment. It, it sounds like the worst thing that could be possible, but is it? I mentioned a couple weeks ago that Eugene Peterson was, was promoted to glory, that he passed away. And, um, and he used to say that, that one of the things prophets do is to get people to accept the worst things as God's judgment. Not... The worst things aren't necessarily religious catastrophe or this political disaster, but, but prophets see these things as judgment. And if what seems to be the worst turns out to be God's judgment, then Peterson argues that then it, then it can be embraced, not necessarily just simply denied or avoided. But if God is good and intends our salvation, then judgment is actually helpful. Judgment certainly is not what human beings have in their planned future or their desired future. Um, but judgment, then, is never the worst thing that can happen. It is, in some senses, the very best, for it is the work of God to set the world and us right. Uh, Frederick Buechner writes it this way. The New Testament proclaims that at some unforeseeable time in the future, God will ring down the final curtain on history, and there will come a day on which all our days and all the judgments upon us and all our judgments upon each other will themselves be judged. 
the judge will be Christ. In other words, the one who judges us most finally will be the one who loves us most fully. I mean, the judgment that Judah faces is judgment they've, they've set themselves up for by their own actions. But judgment is not the last word. Even in this seemingly despairing, nearly hopeless judgment, there is this hope, this flickering, dim future hope of this holy seed. The truth of the matter is that we all, in some senses, become what we worship. Just like Judah, God's judgment for us is that we become like the idols that we worship. Uh, N.T. Wright a little bit more fully, right? You become like what you worship. When you gaze in awe, admiration, and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object that you worship. I mean, think about it. Maybe, you know, it seems ridiculous. You know, I don't bow down to a block of wood. But, but surely you and I have our share of idols, idols that prevent us from becoming more and more like the true God. You know, when our idol is money, we become greedy. When our idol is family, we become cut off from the world. When our idol is more, we are never satisfied. When our idol is fun and recreation, we become perpetually bored. When our idol is gossip, we become scandal-seeking. When our idol is the past, we become stuck in it. When our idol is the future, we miss out on the present. And so God's judgment, in effect, is this, that we become what we worship. And so maybe we should be asking ourselves, what is it that I'm worshiping, and what am I becoming? And maybe we ask that second question first to find the answer to the first. What am I becoming? Well, maybe I should be looking and understanding that that's probably because of, because of what I'm worshiping. So what about Isaiah? Does Isaiah become what he worships, right? In the first four verses of our passage, Isaiah stands in awe of the holiness of God. I mean, even the holy seraphs have to shield their eyes from the glory of God. Back and forth they proclaim, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Right? God is holy. Nothing but God's holiness can can quickly put our life kind of back into right perspective. And, and maybe the most important thing that I do as a pastor isn't to kind of solve problems or isn't to attend meetings, isn't to visit the sick, isn't to fix the photocopier when it jams. No, the, I think my primary responsibility as a pastor in this congregation, the most important thing I do is to stand here week after week and to stay and to remind myself and us, let us worship the Lord. If that stops being the primary thing I do in terms of my energy and my imagination, then I don't think I continue to function as a pastor. We need to worship the Lord. We need to hear his word. We need to offer ourselves to God. And, and worship becomes a place where our lives become redefined for us. Uh, this is our greatest need in times of great need, to have our lives redefined maybe even ruined and then remade, but it happens through an encounter with the wonderful, sometimes terrifying, King of Glory. To see God really as he is. And of course, then we ask, but what, really, what is God like? This both sublime and exalted being, this, this God who is beyond fully knowing, whom we long to still know. If all his attributes were distilled down and crystallized into a single word, what would that word be? Well, of course, the seraphs know. Holy, holy, holy. Back and forth they repeat it, night and day, world without end. God is holy. Isaiah, though, can't quite yet join the song. His life is still being redefined for him. An encounter with God's holiness does that to us. It gives rise not always to song and dance, but sometimes to, to wild, harrowing terror. God's holiness stops us in our tracks, and sometimes we respond not with wow, but whoa. Woe is me. Mark Buchanan, uh, a writer, puts it uh, this way in the Holy Wild. When we see God, we also see ourselves. When we, see, when we behold his holiness, we see in that instant our unholiness. His glory reveals our ruin, his purity our vanity, his light our shadows. God bursts forth radiance. And we cry out for the rocks to fall on us. And so before joy comes sorrow. 
Before cleanness comes shame, before we can ever rest in the holiness of God, first we must become undone by it. Hopefully that's what we as a church and uh, churches across this city and across the country and the world do when we gather for worship. We allow ourselves to be undone by the holiness of God, ever looking forward to being and resting in his holiness. And, and maybe you've had a kind of woe is me experience, uh, right? An experience where, where God's holiness, you know, kind of undid you, where you were, you were just awestruck. You cried out, woe is me. Right? Maybe you've had that kind of experience in public worship. You're, you're suddenly struck dumb by the holiness of God. Or, or maybe you've had that experience in the good creation of God, right? You're overwhelmed by your minuteness compared to just how truly awesome our God is. Or maybe you've experienced that in judgment when the consequences of your own sin were a megaphone yelling out how holy God is and how unholy we are. And there you are thinking about God's holiness and, and you kind of echo Isaiah in your heart and in your mind. Woe to me, for I am rude. I'm, I'm a person of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And maybe simultaneously, there's no better place to be than in the presence of this holy God. Is it, any, is it any really surprise that when we see God high and lifted up, our first instinct is like Isaiah to kind of recoil, right? We who, who since Adam and Eve can no longer be naked without shame, who, who have unclean lips, who, who live among people of unclean lips, is it any wonder that when we come across this holy, 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 God, our first instinct is to kind of recoil. And, and it's Isaiah who kind of shows us this, right? Isaiah, who by all biblical accounts was a fellow who, who towered with righteousness, and, and when he comes into the presence of God's holiness, even Isaiah is undone. He recoils. I saw this floating around the interweb this week, and um, uh, it goes like this. Random churchgoer, I didn't really like worship today. Francis Jan, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. <laughs> and I like that. I, I don't say this, you know, in a, in a way that's, you know, kind of subliminal, like don't, don't tell me you didn't like worship because that's what I'll say back to you. But not at all, right? We, we got to do, we ought to do, and, and spend our energy and our time leading and, and uh, guiding worship well. Absolutely. But I think maturity also includes seeing ourselves as this work in progress. Um, the way uh, Mark Buchanan kind of notes, when Isaiah, what Isaiah demonstrates to us is that, that those who are the most holy are least likely to see themselves that way. Right? Isaiah himself is well on the road towards becoming what he worships because of his maybe um, mature, uh, humble view of himself. So uh, Isaiah cries out in verse 10, How long, O Lord? How long? Right? And the words, of course, echo the cry of the psalmist. Apparently, the, the Lord wanted Judah to hear the bad news before they could hear the good news. Judah had to hear no before she could hear yes. And so verse 13 concludes, But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. The great oak had become a stump, so that a shoot could come forth. Isaiah 1, verse 29 had warned, you will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted, right? And, and maybe you know this already, but just as a reminder, sacred oaks they are the places where pagans, pagan sacrifices were offered. Sacred oaks were where idols were worshipped. And so the sacred oaks need to be cut down. Judgment must occur if the holy seed, if the hope of the holy seed is to shoot out of the stump. And so the good news is, is that our God's judgment is hope-filled. <clears throat> it knocks down the idols that we worship and replaces them with the hope of, of shoots coming out of stumps. <clears throat> it's a story again and again of, of death uh, leading to new life, of, of dying that leads to rising. And, and the good news, of course, for us is that God longs to share this holiness. He's not tight-fisted with us. He's He's not avoiding us like sometimes we avoid looking at him. He's not stingy with this. He's, he's not defensive about it. 
Um, Eugene Peterson, I read this past week, his, his son Leif said uh, these words at his father's funeral this, uh, last week. He said that his dad only actually had one sermon and that he had fooled you know, people for 29 years of pastoral ministry um, that for all his books and all his writing and all his sermons, he really actually only had one message. And it was a secret leaf that his dad kind of let him in on uh, early in his life. And it was a message that his dad whispered into Leaf's heart for, for 50 years. Words that he snuck into his room to say over him while he slept as a child. And they were words that were simply this. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming after you. He is relentless. Right? God wants to come along and compress his holiness into something hand-sized like a brick of coal and then press it deep and searing into us. And so he does. With Isaiah, God, God sends one of those singing seraphs who amazingly must pause that eternal song of God's holiness to do this. And, and the seraph brings that live burning coal and the seraph enacts the severe mercy of God. He brands Isaiah's lips. He burns them clean. Our God is a consuming fire. Uh, Jesus didn't come just to bring peace, not at first, but also fire and a sword. And the fire of, of God is this holiness, and it either destroys us or it cleanses us. And in the face of God's holiness, we are either ruined or cleansed, or a little bit of both. The holiness of God first consumes us and ruins us, but if we submit, it, it cuts the burden and burns the, the skin and sets us free. We become what we worship, and and that God who invites us into that says also, be holy as I am holy. I realized about five minutes before the service that this placeholder of a stump and a shoot I, I used in this picture, and I, I, I didn't replace it, so sorry about that. You get the same picture again. Um, but the point is that there's really, there's really only one way to get there from here, and that is through worship. That we become what we worship. I mean, nobody rests in the holiness of God by, by merely contemplating their way into it. It's not by academics or, or theological prowess. It's not Bible memorization or, or the number of church services attended. It, it only comes from actually seeing God. Now, of course, to be sure, God can be seen in study and memorization and services and theology all those things. But the most important way to rest in God's holiness is to worship. To put ourselves consistently in a posture of worship, in a place of worship, amongst people who are worshiping, helps us more than anything else to see God. I mean, that's why the church through the ages has, has encouraged people to gather Sunday after Sunday to, to worship the living God. We need to see God. And in worship, we, we don't just come to show God our devotion and give him our praise. We're called to worship because this encounter, in this encounter, God remakes and molds us kind of from the top down. Worship is the arena in which God kind of recalibrates our hearts and, and changes and reforms our desires and readjusts the things that we ought to love. But in order to see this holy, holy, holy God, we need to give ourselves a vantage point to do so. Uh, for a number of years... I've received email alerts from the Geophysical Institute of the University of Alaska. I just like to be able to say that. Um, I actually had to write it down so I remembered it. Uh, and why do I do that? Because this is their website, and it, it, it has a northern lights forecast. And so in order to see the northern lights, I, I check my email sometimes, and, and I make a point of then looking at the night sky when, when, when the ratings are higher than, than others, right? Uh, provided, of course, that it's a relatively cloudless night in Terrace, which doesn't always happen. But the point is, you've got to put yourself in a vantage point to be able to see, right? Um, I mean, sometimes the northern lights are, you know, kind of a faint glow on the horizon. You can barely make them out. But other times, they are a dazzling and, and brilliant and dancing, incredible display. Like an encounter with our holy, holy, holy God. It can leave us undone. And we are remade. It, he shows us his holiness. When we think about that line, you are what you eat, I mean, that can be bad news for those of us if we're eating nerds or nuts, unless you are happy to be nuts and nerds. Anyways, but, you know, that, but that can certainly be powerfully good news as well, right? Um, Reformed thinker Jamie Smith, in, a, in his wonderful book called You Are What You Love, 
you are what you love, points out that you can't think your way into new hungers. Discipleship happens through worship. And God's holiness can be our salvation if we will only let it shape us and form us. And so uh, Smith talks about, uh, about formative worship, painting a, a picture of the beauty of the Lord and a vision of shalom, right? Uh, the shalom that God desires for creation in, in a way that just kind of captures our imagination. And so the, the biblical vision of shalom, Smith writes, uh, the biblical vision of shalom, of a world where the, the lamb is our light, where swords are beaten into plowshares, where abundance is enjoyed by all, where people from every tribe and tongue and nation sing the same song of praise, where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an everlasting steam. This, this shalom is the vision that should be enacted in Christian worship. And so the Apostle John, near the end of his life, was, was caught up into worship. And he saw what Isaiah had seen 800 years before. And we get this picture from, from Revelation 4. I'm just going to read this passage from Revelation, a few selected sections from it. And so this is what John records. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing, to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And, and, and you can hear it, I think, right, that John's vision mirrors and echoes Isaiah's vision, right? The seraphim, all these centuries later, are still singing their song of God's holiness, never tiring. But there are at least a couple things that are different. And one is that, that 800 years earlier, when we, what we read from Isaiah, only the angels are singing. Heaven's music was maybe more, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but you know, was, was performed by an elite company, a chamber choir of angels. But now, all heaven and all of earth join in the song. It's no longer a song for a few, but it's the chorus of all of creation. And the second uh, difference uh, that I think is worth noting is maybe a even more significant. In, in the vision that we have in Isaiah, the seraphim all around God's throne use two of their wings to cover their faces, to cover their eyes, right? I mean, even though they're holy, they can't bef um, behold the perfection of God's holiness. It's too much for them even to gaze upon them. But in, in John's vision, the creatures who surround God's thrones are covered with eyes in front and in back. Each has six wings and is covered with eyes all around, even under their wings. In, in effect, they're all eyes. They can do no other than look full on the Lord, high and lifted up. Why? I mean, what's changed in those 800 years? Well, just this. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Or as John the Baptist once de declared, about Jesus, of course. Behold, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? The difference, of course, is Jesus. The Lamb of God who, who takes away the sins of, of anyone, of, of everyone, of everyone who calls upon his name. Of, of me, a person of unclean lips, of, of you. Because of Jesus, what once was forbidden for angels to look upon, now all eyes can see. And the song that once mighty prophets dared not sing, now all creation can join in saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I speak these words to you in the name of our holy God come down, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to invite